Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Uh, EESI is a nonprofit organization that was established by a bipartisan congressional caucus uh, about 35 years ago to make sure that we were all helping policymakers learn more about energy and environmental issues and to find solutions to those kinds of problems that have been uh, loomed very, very large across our great country. So this afternoon, we are delighted to have this briefing on equitable solutions to rural energy burdens. We are very glad to be partnering with Congressman Clyburn, as well as the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, and of course, um, the National Cooperative Business Association uh, uh, Calusa. And uh, at this time, I would like to turn the podium over to our partner, um, Doug O'Brien, who is the president and CEO of NCBA. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Carol. Uh, welcome, everyone, and welcome uh, to those who are participating virtually. Uh, and we're also uh, we're recording this event today so more and more folks can have the benefit of the conversation today. It's going to be a great conversation about a really important topic. Um, I just want to introduce myself. Carol mentioned uh, I am Doug O'Brien from the National Cooperative Business Association. We're uh, an association here in the U.S., been around for over 100 years, and our mission is to promote, defend, and advocate for the cooperative business model. We do advocacy, uh, thought leadership, public awareness, and development, including uh, significant work on international development. So we work with the cooperative community across the United States, uh, including rural electric cooperatives, major, major stakeholders in our association in the cooperative community here in the United States. Uh, I do want to thank Carol and I want to thank the Environmental and Energy Study Institute uh, for their partnership in an initiative that we're working together on that we call the, the Partnership for Advancing an Inclusive Rural Energy Economy. It's really at the core of what we're talking about today. The goal of this partnership is to put more money in the pockets of people in rural communities and to catalyze rural development uh, by supporting rural electric cooperatives in developing member responsive programs for energy efficiency upgrades and, re and clean energy projects. We work with Congress, we work the agency at USDA uh, to help uh, catalyze activity in, in rural places. And at the end of the day, what this work is really about is putting more money in the pockets of families in rural America, uh, and probably in particular those households that are more limited in income. Uh, a lot of people, many people in this room, certainly in this building, talk all the time about the need to make sure that, um, that rural people have that opportunity to improve their livelihood, uh, to improve the stability and the opportunity for their family. At the end of the day, some of the strategies that we're talking about today, I believe, are some of the most effective uh, and really the most uh, realistic strategies to really make a difference in the incomes and in the pocketbooks of these rural families. And we're really going to dig into that, uh, which we look forward to. Of course, I want to acknowledge uh, a real leader in this space of, of, of taking care uh, and looking towards helping rural families, and that's the Honorable James Clyburn, uh, who helped make this, uh, this event, this room, and, and hosting this event, so we want to thank him. We, we're going to get to see Representative Clyburn as soon as he's able to, to join us after votes. Um, you know, I, I do just want to say, so I don't take up the time in the room when he walks in, that Congressman Clyburn is, is just a... a you know, one of the strongest advocates for rural electric cooperatives, for rural constituents of the 6th Congressional District in South Carolina. And I'll add that the Congressman is a particularly admired champion for his constituents uh, and, and all Americans who are living on low incomes. He, again, just recently uh, partnered with, uh, with a Senate colleague to introduce the 10-20-30 legislation, which is focused on making sure that federal resources are focused towards those persistent poverty counties, 85% uh, of all persistent poverty counties in rural places. So it's going to be great to see Congressman Clyburn. I do want to mention uh, one of our members and, and one of the sponsors for this event, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. I want to thank them uh, for their leadership in this space and for partnering on this event. Um, so we do have a great lineup of speakers today. Uh, Beyond uh, Congressman Clyburn that I mentioned before, we'll, we'll also get to see Congressman, uh, the Honorable uh, G.K. Butterfield. He, he'll join us too as, as the schedule, the vote schedule allows. 
He represents the 1st Congressional District of North Carolina, uh, which happens to be the place where uh, one of our first speakers is, is from, Curtis Wynn. So um, uh, Congressman Butterfield will be with us and, uh, and uh, talk about that community, talk about uh, some of the work that, that Curtis has led there and so important to his district. Now, as, as far as run of show, I'll just, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to do a, a quick introduction of our, of our panelists today, and then I'm going to get out of the way and, and, uh, and invite them to the podium. So just some short bios. Uh, certainly the materials for those that are in the room here, we have more materials, more information on the table. Uh, for those who are experiencing this uh, virtually, uh, those materials are, I'm sure, within a click, and please do take a look at, uh, at these materials. So. So uh, to no further ado, here's our speakers. The, the first is Curtis Wynn. He is the president and CEO of Roanoke Electric Cooperative in North Carolina. He has nearly 38 years experience in the electric utility industry and Curtis is also the president of the, of the board for the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. He serves on that board of, uh, he also serves on the National Rural Utilities Cooperative Finance uh, Corporation uh, and I'm proud to say both of, both of these entities are part of NCBA CLUSA, part of that strong, uh, cohesive, cooperative community that we get to be part of. I'd also like to introduce Mary Shoemaker, and she is a senior research analyst at the American Council for Energy Efficiency Economy, where she conducts a mix of research, analysis, and outreach on energy efficiency opportunities in the United States and leads ACEEE, -E -E, ACEEE's uh, Rural Energy Initiative. Good to have you here, Mary. And then back over to this side, Chris McLean, uh, a former colleague of mine uh, from USDA, is the Assistant Administrator of the Rural Utility Service Electric Program at USDA. He has served as the Acting Administrator for RUS, um, and, uh, and Chris uh, started his federal career as a Senate staffer and has served in a number of uh, positions at RUS and at USDA. Good to see you, Chris. Glad you're here. Chad Lauder, back to my right, your left is the CEO of the Tri-County Electric Cooperative. It's headquartered in St. Matthews, South Carolina. Chad has uh, been part of the cooperative for 19 years and has served in the role of CEO for the last six. Prior to becoming the CEO, Chad was the manager of marketing and government relations uh, at the cooperative. And finally, Mark Case, uh, over to my left, is the general manager and CEO of Wachita Electric Cooperative, headquartered in Camden, Arkansas, and has served in this capacity since January of 2002. In 2017, Wachita was named the Cooperative of the Year by the Smart Electric Power Association. And in 2018, Mark was recognized by the Public Utilities fortnightly as one of the top 40 innovators in the United States. So uh, I'm going to hand this over to Curtis for some remarks. Uh, uh, in just a moment, I will mention that uh, as we are fortunate enough to, to see the congressmen when they arrive, we'll, uh, we'll manage our agenda to make sure that we're able to, to hear from them. And we do have time for question and answer when all the speakers go through and, uh, and just a few concluding remarks. And with no further ado, Curtis. Thank you, Doug. And good afternoon to everyone. It's good to be here with you. Um, I want to, in my few minutes before you this morning, I, don't, I want to draw a few connections, um, three actually, one being uh, what today's topic, um, equitable solutions to rural energy burdens. Um, I want to draw that connection to my platform as NRECA's president and also tie that to the role and the work that we're doing at my local cooperative in, in northeastern North Carolina, Congressman Butterfield's district, which is really one of the um, poorest districts in the country in terms of, of economic uh, and, and opportunity is concerned. So I'll draw those three connections and, and bring that back to um, what I believe is a business case for what we're talking about. So first of all, with um, as it relates to, to, to my uh, platform as, as NRECA's president, there's one key element that I've been talking about all over the country, and, and that has to do with the, the rapid pace of change that is happening in the rural utility industry. Um, technology is changing, the industry is changing at a very rapid pace, and as utility executives go through our daily jobs, we're having to keep up, and that's, that is really something that all of us face on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, secondly, 
as it, as it relates to my platform, there are three key themes or charges that I, uh, I think that we have to pay attention to. And these are realities that we face every day. The first is that in in this space that we call electric cooperatives and the electric utility industry at large, market forces are ruling the day. Uh, it's really actually something we have to pay close attention to, whether it's member expectations, whether it is uh, the way people look at us as utilities. The market is taking the place of what used to be a role for policy. Uh, so Doug, the Congressman is here, so you want to go kick. Um, so what used to take the place of, of, of policy, so uh, market forces are very important to us. That's one of the, the, the themes that we're, we're, we've been talking about and a reality that we face. The second is that, and this ties directly to what we're talking about today, is that the importance of efficiency and sustainability. Um, that is a reality that as cooperatives, we've got to grapple with that and figure out how to run our utilities more efficiently and pay closer attention to sustainability. And last, of course, is the, the, the whole grid modernization and having grid flexibility. And what that, what that means in terms of, of what we do from a day-to-day -day basis is that the flow of electricity, as it used to be, used to be coming from one central source going in one direction to serve the member consumer. Uh, energy is being produced in numerous places, whether it's rooftops, whether it's community solar, or wherever, whatever the case may be, and we're having to manage that flow of electricity and give, a, give us a, a quick and easy but yet complicated way to manage the flow from, from the source back to where it's being used and make sure that all of that is integrated. And there's also disruption that has to come into play as we look at our, ourselves from a sustainability standpoint. Uh, we're very prone to being disrupted as a utility. Um, what disruptors love to, to do is prey on businesses that are holding on to antiquated ways of doing business and they've brought efficient to, to efficiency into their processes and that creates opportunities, particularly on the consumer side of the meter. And we're having to make sure that we move to the consumer side of the meter and be a part of that, which is something we have never done in the past. And we have to acknowledge that these are realities, we have to act on these, and we have to do it in a leadership capacity that we all have as leaders in this industry. So that is my platform, and I want to transition now to talk about locally how that platform ties to what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Every day at Roanoke Electric, we're not growing as a utility, and we're trying to figure out how to survive as an organization. So the second reality that I talked to you about was efficiency and sustainability. And our whole business strategy has evolved to be about efficiency and sustainability. And let me just tell you a little bit about what I mean by that. We're doing a whole lot with energy efficiency. Um, we're basically making investments in energy efficiency. And we're also putting smart energy devices out into the consumer's home. We're also getting into smart, the smart grid and, and automated metering infrastructure. And finally, we're doing distributed energy, energy resources all across our system. But none of that is possible if we don't have a robust communication system in place, which has gotten us into the broadband business. Now, what you saw, those, you saw all four of those, those items pop up in a part of our pie chart called power supply. That is the biggest expense that we have as a utility. And, and as a utility, we're figuring out that if we cut back on that biggest expense in our, our operating statement, we're becoming more efficient. But at the same time, we're showing our member consumers how to be more efficient on their side. That is the business case. And that is really something that we as a, as a cooperative is, has, has, have decided to, to invest in. Now, there's also this, this, this word, this term that we are using quite often called beneficial electrification. And that is the use of electricity to replace other sources of energy, such as fuel, diesel, and those types of things. And cooperatives in general are looking at that as a, as a good opportunity for us to grow our businesses. Now, I want to just talk some about our energy efficiency program and the type of investments. What you see in front of you really is just the, the types of investments we've made in, with regards to energy efficiency. The average investment we're making in the home to improve the envelope is about $7,000 per retrofit. And the reason we're doing that is because the more of these we do, 
for every, and then the first thought that you may have is, well, why would you cut back on what you sell? If you're selling electricity, why would you encourage your members not to do it? But for every dollar that we, that we save for our members, we're gaining in other efficiencies, such as the cost of, for the demand for electricity. So as you can see, the, for $2,000 that we may, $2,700 we may lose in energy sales, we're gaining about $10,000 and demand cost savings. So that's the business case. Overall, for every retrofit that we do to support our members, there is a return on that investment. So over a 20-year period, as you can see, as we do these retrofits, and we are doing quite a few of those, we're saving dollars off of our bottom line by making those types of investments. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. The, the next three, I'm going to make sure I have I save enough time for my colleagues. but. I just want to mention that where we live in our district, we have, for every retrofit we do, we are probably turning one person down because there is some type of health and safety issue that they are experiencing that would not allow us to make that $7,000 investment. But the short story is, is that we've been creative enough to bring partners into the mix to allow us to do the upfront cost before they get to the energy efficiency uh, level to make some investments such as repairing leaky roofs and other health and safety issues that may be a part of that residence. And we're, we're working with partners through a community solar project to do that. I don't have enough time to get into the details on that, but just know that when, uh, one thing about a cooperative, when your board says figure something out, as CEOs, basically we learn how to figure out, right Chad, we figure out how to, see, how to figure it out. <laughs> so that's something we were told to do and over time we brought partners in. So we're really combining a land loss retention project with an energy efficiency project with a retrofit project. And it took a lot of creativity to bring additional partners into the play to make that happen. Uh, but if you get the slides, you can learn more about how that works. Uh, but, but finally, just to get down to the, to the very end of this and, and, and move to the next speaker, I just want to say more about the business case. If you take the energy efficiency piece and look at the savings there, and you, you, you compound on top of that the investment of smart thermostats, smart energy devices, and tie those to what we call in the business a demand response program, which on a day like today when it's almost 110 degree index, heat index outside, rather than having window unit air conditionings running trying to keep people cool, if you've got high efficiency heat pumps running with smart thermostats on those heat pumps where when we're getting ready to get into the most expensive power that we can purchase, we partner with our members to say we're going to raise that temperature a few degrees so that we don't pay that ex for that expensive electricity. Those are the kinds of things we're doing to make sure that we bring value and create opportunities for all of our members. And the, the business case I want to want to end with here is that when we do that, instead of it being viewed as support for a low-income citizen, when we do that as a system, we're lowering the cost for every person that is is a part of electric of the electric cooperative. And that, to me, is the business case that we we have here: is that it does not cost, or you do not subsidize these programs by doing them that you, when you're doing them, you're actually providing benefit for the entire system. So I want to just end with that. Um, I know we're going to have a chance for questions and answers, so I'll, I'll move on to the next person. Great. Thank you. Curtis, thank you. For so many reasons, I couldn't think of a better person to, to, to be the first speaker. Curtis Wynn, a real um, absolute leader uh, in his cooperative in Roanoke, North Carolina, but uh, certainly for the uh, rural electric cooperative community and for cooperatives writ large. So uh, really laying out that business case and, and the real results for the communities and the families uh, of the cooperative. I'd like to introduce uh, now uh, is Congressman Butterfield. Did I got word that he's here? Very good. There he is. Uh, and uh, he, he's someone who knows uh, Curtis well. He, he uh, represents Curtis and, and uh, the other good folks from the 1st District of uh, North Carolina and invite him to the podium right now. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Curtis. Thank you. 
First, let me apologize for, for the delay in getting here this afternoon. As all of you should know, we've been on the floor for the last hour or so doing the people's business. But thank you so very much for coming, and thank you for your profound interest in rural energy. This is something that we really, really, really care about in eastern North Carolina. I represent 14 counties in eastern North Carolina, northeast of North Carolina, and Roanoke is certainly an integral part of, of my congressional district. Uh, as such, I've gotten an opportunity over the last uh, 10 or 15 years to get to know Curtis Wynn, and, and I can tell you that he is doing a great work there with Roanoke, and so much so that the National Association has now elected him as the president of the National Association. So he knows the subject matter, and, and when he speaks, we listen. And so thank you, Curtis, for your leadership, and thank you for all the great work that you are doing. Uh, not only are they providing electric service to our rural communities, but they are in the space of broadband and, and uh, so many other areas that are critically important to low-income rural residents. So thank Thank you for coming. Thank you for the incredible work that you do. I also want to thank the majority whip of the, of the House of Representatives, my friend, uh, Congressman Jim Clyburn. Jim has been on the front line uh, of rural energy issues ever since I've been in Congress and many years before I got here. So thank you to Mr. Clyburn and his staff for putting together the format today, and thank all of you for the incredible work that you do. Thank you. Congressman, thank you for those remarks and your leadership uh, in North Carolina and uh, in Congress and across the United States. I would like to ask uh, the Majority Whip uh, and our host, uh, uh, Jim Clyburn, to please join us at the podium. And I, I want to repeat it, uh, just a couple things I was able to say at the beginning. Thank you uh, for making this event uh, possible and much more. Thank you for your leadership uh, here in Congress uh, in, uh, in your great congressional district and, and for rural folks across the United States. As I mentioned in, in my remarks at top, there's no greater advocate, tireless advocate uh, for the people in rural America, uh, certainly including the use of rural electric cooperatives and particularly uh, for those folks in, in uh, economically distressed households. So again, uh, Congressman, thank you very much for hosting and please join us for some remarks. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for being, thank you. Thank you. I know he's not in the program, but I'm asking him to come on down here so he can see his face. He's trying to learn a little something. Uh, you've heard from North Carolina, now South Carolina. Uh, uh, who came in the room with me is uh, Sanford Bishop, who is from Georgia. Uh, he's got a little, a few rural communities. Uh, so Sanford Bishop, thank you so much for being here. Uh, let me just uh, thank all of you uh, for uh, what you're doing in order to make the greatness of this country affordable and accessible for all citizens. That's my mantra. That's what I'm living by. I mean, I live up here for one thing only, and that is to make this nation's greatness accessible and affordable for all of its citizens. It can be education, housing, and today, we're talking about energy. Uh, one of the most interesting things from that, those of you in the co-op business, uh, you may um, have read this book. It's a tabletop that was done by the electric co-ops in celebration of the 50th anniversary uh, back in 19, uh, I guess it was 85. And the book was called The Next Greatest Thing. I keep a copy here in my office and one uh, in my home in South Carolina. And th that book's title came from a testimony given in a rural church in Tennessee where a gentleman stood before the congregation and said, the greatest thing that can happen for anyone is to have the love of God in one's heart. But the next greatest thing is to have electricity <laughs> in one's home. And I think that, to me, gives rise to the next, next greatest thing, and that is to have broadband accessible and affordable throughout rural America. 
several years ago when um, I was having one of my listening sessions, I, uh, you hear a lot about town hall meetings. Uh, every now and then I will have one when I'm uh, sort of trying to keep uh, faith with my caucus. I'll have a town hall. But I have a lot of listening sessions. I go around my district, and I sit down in rural churches, in other rural gatherings, and I listen. And one day, during one of my listening sessions, it came up to me that a lot of rural people in my congressional districts were having real challenges trying to pay their utility bills simply because uh, they were heating the bushes around their houses because of the lack of insulation, the clouds because it needed roofs, a lot of escaping underground that needed aprons under the ground. The HVAC system in the manufactured South Carolina is number one in the nation in manufactured housing. And so a lot of this manufactured housing come with the lack of the proper insulation. And so I noticed that Chad and company started something called Help My House. <clears throat> and what they were doing, they were rounding up. Now, I, I, I should have known this because I'm a member of Tri-County Electric Co-op. Um, and uh, I notice when I get my bill every month, there's always a round number. And that's always suspicious. <laughs> always a round number. <clears throat> but they had started this program that they call Roundup, where if your bill were 1950, it becomes $20. My last bill was like something old too. So I contributed 98 cents to Roundup. And so I ask, explain this to me. How does this work and why are you doing this? And that's when I was told exactly what was going on. That money was being gathered, put in a pot, and anybody is a member of that co-op could go into that little pot of money and do what's necessary to make their homes energy efficient and pay it back on their monthly bills. I said, this ought to be a national program. It took us six years to get it done. But Congress finally wised up and did it. And this year, $100 million in the program to help energy efficient or to make homes and businesses energy efficient because we amended the bill later to add businesses as well. And so I'm very pleased that you're here now. I really uh, want to thank Chad. I understand uh, that around 30, 35 or 40 of your members have now taken advantage of this program. I think we started off with 13 million in South Carolina. Uh, I'm glad that the people have had enough sense uh, to honor us with uh, their first little tranche of money. Uh, now, $100 million available, and we're going to keep plussing this up because we believe uh, that rural energy savings is going to be one of the things that's going to be a really national program broadly used going forward. And I want all of you uh, to, to remember this, and I'll close with this. I, um, I've been telling this story. The last time I told the story <clears throat> was to a rural, to the co-ops. He had the national program up here several weeks ago. And I talked about the man who came up here who was a farmer from Chester, South Carolina. He was the national group of farmers because last year they borrowed money and um, when the crops came, the floods came, and they lost their crops. Now, not credit worthy. So they came up to ask us, which we finally did, 
to be of assistance. But one gentleman was there was from uh, Chester, South Carolina. He says, now, Congressman, I came up here to talk to you about my cotton farm and ask you for some disaster relief. But that's not what's on my heart today. He said, what's on my heart are the families in my community who go off to work in the mornings, come home at 5 in the afternoon, and they load their children up into automobiles and take them down to the parking lot of the local library. And they sit out in their automobiles to do their homework because that's the only place that they can get onto the Internet. That should not be. That should not be. When I told the story <clears throat> to the co-ops, a lady came to me afterwards. She said, I just retired as a school administrator, and I just had a teacher to fail a bunch of students. And I went to him and asked him, why had he failed all those students? And he told me, she said, it's because they were all refusing to do my homework. And she asked him, well, how do you assign homework? And he said, I do it over the Internet. She said, don't you know that these children do not have the Internet in their homes? I didn't ask her what happened to those students. They had already failed. Something is wrong with that. So if our children are going to get properly educated, you got to give them the next greatest thing. If we're going to have telehealth in our rural communities, where in South Carolina we just closed five rural hospitals, we need broadband. You've done it. Co-ops have done it. You know how to do it for electricity. And I do believe God has given you what it takes to do it for broadband. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. I do, and I do want to take the opportunity to, to invite um, Sanford, Congressman Sanford Bishop uh, from the 2nd District of Georgia, a great leader here in Congress and a leader in the ag appropriations, uh, a real supporter of rural communities through co-ops, through co-op development, and in particular through the breast program we're talking about today. So uh, uh, we're just so fortunate to have you with us today. Thank you for taking a few minutes, Congressman. First of all, let me thank you all for being here, and let me thank my colleague, um, uh, Jim Clyburn, for organizing this. Uh, Jim Clyburn and uh, uh, G.K. Butterfield are very, very close friends of mine. Uh, we have been, we have bonded uh, uh, since before we, we came to Congress. But I'm not going to take long, but I want to say, I, I chair the Agriculture Subcommittee. It's called Agriculture Rural Development and uh, FDA and related agencies. Uh, I took this subcommittee when we got the majority uh, because I have a passion for rural communities. Uh, I represent the second congressional district of Georgia, which is 29 counties. 26 of those counties are rural. One of them happens to be Sumter County, uh, which is the home of Jimmy Carter in Plains, Georgia. Uh, I celebrated the 75th anniversary of Rural Electric uh, with uh, President Carter, and he talked about what uh, Rural Electric meant uh, to his life as a child when it, was, uh, when it came to rural Georgia. Uh, but I believe very strongly, and I have a passion for rural America, I believe that no child or no family uh, should fail to realize its potential because of the zip code that they happen to be living in. No business in rural America should be shortchanged uh, because of where it's located. And so not only does agriculture include the crops and conservation, but rural development where rural utilities, rural housing, a rural economic development is centered for our rural America. Uh, that is where 
we need to put a lot of emphasis. And that's my passion, and that's why I took the chairmanship of that subcommittee, and which is why I am so supportive of my colleague Jim Clyburn with the Rural Energy Assistance Program and with all of the rural programs. And so I want you to know that there are two kinds of committees in Congress. There are authorizing committees. They write the wish list. But there are appropriations committees and subcommittees that write the checks. And I just want you to know that as long as I am the chair of the subcommittee, uh, and I think we have bipartisan support for this, we're going to do our dead level best to make sure that America's rural communities get the resources they need so that the people who live there can realize their full potential. We've got some of the best, some of the brightest, and most ingenious and creative people living in these communities. All they need is the opportunity and the resources, and we want to do our best to make that happen. You are an important, a significant part of that. And I'll close with one of my favorite poems, which is called A Bag of Tools. And it goes like this, isn't it strange how princes and kings and clowns that caper in sawdust rings and common folks like you and me are builders for eternity. Each is given a bag of tools, a shapeless mass and a set of rules, and each must make your life as flown a stumbling block or a stepping stone. I just want to thank you, and I hope that you will continue what you are doing and join with all others of like mind, uh, not to be stumbling blocks, but to be stepping stones for a higher and a better life for all America, but particularly those who live in rural America. Thank you for what you do. Keep doing it, and we want to work with you. God bless you. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for those remarks, Congressman Bishop. Um, now next, uh, we want to take just a very short video that, that really, I think, uh, does an excellent job of, of kind of laying out some of the challenge, but also some of the potential and opportunity here. And this is from ACEEE, uh, and the, the video is the rural energy burden. So if we're ready to run that. It's been a long time since my heating system been broken. Been a long time. After my system went out, I never could get it fixed because it was just too much. I, I couldn't afford it. So I had to let it go and I just started getting to be some heaters for the winter. And for the summer, I get fans. And it wasn't doing anything but just running my light bill up, 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 up. Well, it ran my light bill up to four and five and six hundred dollars a month. I'm on a fixed income. The slight building got so out of hand, I'm worried that they're going to, you know, soon put me in the dark. A lot of the people that live in the rural areas, homes have a tendency, I will say, to not be well insulated. They're losing energy through leaky ductwork or leaky windows, and they're paying for that. When you can't pay your power bill with one whole paycheck, you have a problem. And that's not counting you've got four kids and groceries and gas to get back to work, you know. When your power bill is $589, then that doesn't leave a whole lot of room for anything. I had to make some choices on whether to pay my high energy bill or cut back on my grocery bill or cut by, back on other necessities that I needed to have from day to day. I had to be very mindful about how much traveling I had to do because I had to be concerned about paying my electric bill. My husband had recently passed. I was a widow and a single parent and I was the only sole source income. I almost gave up and I actually almost walked away from the home. And once I got introduced to this program, I became hopeful. The program that we operate, the on-bill financing program, can be a quick turnaround 
to not only get the problems fixed, but to get the member into a comfortable situation. When the co-op sends us a bid sheet out, we come out and we see what we gotta do to fix the house. We'll come out and air seal them and uh, patching holes if there's any. If they need an, another unit, we put a new unit in. We normally cut them down to light bills in half, especially if you're in a manufactured home that light bills are high. When you analyze my bills, there's at least a minimum of $250 a month in savings compared to what I was paying. I did not understand what being energy efficient was until they did this. I did not understand that I could save that much money if my house was energy efficient. I'm grateful for this program and I just hope that other people will be able to benefit from it because it really did change my life. Yes, it really did. Hi everyone, I'm Mary Shoemaker. I'm with the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, um, ACEEE. Uh, thanks so much for sharing that video. Um, I think it just really drives home the, the tangible impact that energy efficiency can have on people's lives um, and in improving the quality of their lives. Um, my remarks today are gonna be to talk to you about how energy efficiency is one tool in the toolkit for improving rural prosperity. Um, you know, it's not a silver bullet, but as one of my friends uh, in, in Kentucky said, there are a lot of silver BBs, and energy efficiency, I think, is one of them. Um, so, uh, next slide. Actually, I just realized I have this. Thanks. Um, as a little bit of context on ACEEE, we've been around for almost 40 years. Uh, we're a nonprofit based here in D.C., and our bread and butter is really to do research and um, write reports on energy efficiency best practices, looking at how utilities are delivering programs to their customers and members, how state governments are passing policies to help drive those programs, um, and really writing about what we see as best practices, but also convening people to talk about their experiences through conferences and other convenings. There we go. So I'm on ACEEE's state policy team, but I also lead our rural energy initiative. Um, we have had a historical uh, focus on agricultural energy efficiency, and over the past few years, we have really built out our work looking at kind of equity in delivering energy efficiency programs, asking ourselves if the people who need these programs most and can benefit from them most are actually able to access them. Um, with kind of both of those focuses in mind, we, we launched this initiative last year to look more squarely at energy efficiency in rural communities. So we've done a couple of reports on this topic. We had our first rural energy conference last year and we're doing our second one next February. So today I'm gonna to share with you some of our research. So we've been talking about energy burden quite a bit, but I thought it might be helpful just to kind of lay a foundation and make sure we're all kind of coming from the same level of, of understanding of this topic. So an energy burden is the percent of an annual household income that goes towards um, utility costs. Uh, it, it's caused by a variety of factors. Some of them are physical, like the, uh, the quality of a, a home or the um, maybe the economic situation the, the tenants of that home find themselves in. And it has a variety of impacts as well. As you, as you saw from the video, it can really affect the um, indoor air quality and the comfort of, of the tenants of a home. And it can also um, really keep, keep hard-earned money in those households' pockets. So ACEEE last year did a report looking squarely at energy burdens in rural households. We broke down our data by regions, um, but just to share kind of some top level takeaways, we found that the average rural household spends about 4.4% of their income on energy bills. That compares to about 3.1% in metropolitan households. So those are averages, but just from those averages, we found that uh, rural homes pay about 30% more on utility bills than metropolitan homes. And that number will vary based on the region you're looking at, but it will also vary based on which uh, demographic subset you're looking at. 
For example, we found that on average, rural low-income homes pay a lot more on their utility bills, about 9%. And manufactured housing residents, as we saw from the video as an example, they also pay a lot of, um, they have high energy burdens. So energy efficiency is one key tool, as I mentioned, for alleviating energy burdens. Uh, we found that it, it can alleviate up to 25% of an energy burden and save households on average $400 per year. Um, and it also, energy efficiency leads to additional benefits like uh, local job creation and improved public health. One important point that I think folks often get tripped up on is the fact that low energy prices do not always equate to affordable bills. So just because electricity is cheap in an area, as, as it is in many of the, the southeastern states we've been talking about today, um, just because it's cheap doesn't mean that um, it's affordable for the households who are still using more electricity than maybe they need to to, to, ha to lead comfortable lives. So you might be wondering, if energy efficiency is so great, then why doesn't it just happen on its own? Um, so here is where programs come in that are led by co-ops, like my fellow panelists, or state energy offices, or um, nonprofit program implementers. So co-ops play a really important role in first helping their members identify energy savings opportunities, maybe through doing a, a whole home, um, like uh, through measuring their energy use and identifying the specific improvement opportunities. Um, second, utilities and other program implementers can help their customers and members identify funding or financing to lower the upfront costs to actually pursue those improvements. And then last, uh, or not last, but as the third kind of category that I, I want to focus on is helping members access the technical resources they need to actually make those efficiency upgrades. You know, I think a lot of us are comfortable changing out a light bulb or maybe buying a new appliance, but we might not be so comfortable um, adding insulation into our walls or replacing windows. So the second point I mentioned on the last slide, in increasing access to financial resources. There are a few federal programs that play a really key role in doing this, and Administrator McLean is going to dive into them a bit deeper. USDA has a few great programs that are focused on rural community members. Um, the U.S. Department of Energy also has a few great programs that are not explicitly rural focused, but are certainly uh, valuable resources to consider. So the last plug I'll just make is for ACCEE's 2020 Rural Conference. Um, we're hoping to pull together co-op leaders, um, advocates, state government officials, um, federal policymakers, anyone who's really interested in kind of driving deeper energy savings in rural communities. And we'll send out that call for topics next week. So I hope you'll consider joining me. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mary. Next, uh, I want to welcome to the podium administrator McLean uh, to talk about one of the programs uh, and, and really the strategies uh, that Congress and in particular some of the congressmen who were here before have uh, championed um, at USDA Rural Utility Service. So Chris McLean. Chris. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so great to be here as a former Senate staffer. This is like the most relaxed I've ever been coming into the House side of the Capitol. And this is great. I really appreciate um, one being part of this very distinguished panel. And um, I want to have a big, big thank you to Congressman Clyburn, um, Congressman Bif Bishop, and Congressman Butterfield for all that they've done to support this program. It's extremely innovative, and um, we are, we're thrilled to be able to be able to administer the Rural um, Energy Savings Program. Let me give you a little bit of context about the Rural Utility Service and um, USDA. Rural Utility Service is one of three rural development agencies at the United States Department of Agriculture. And we have the Rural Housing Service, which can, as the name implies, invest in housing and community facilities, the Rural Business Service, which creates jobs, and has the Rural Energy for America program for renewable energy, and now for energy efficiency. And then we have the Rural Utility Service, which is the agency that I work in. And I'm the head of the Rural Utility Service Electric Program. And um, RUS is a one-stop utility shop. We invest in telecommunications, electric, water, and sewer infrastructure in rural areas. And the thing to know about utilities in rural America is that everything is more expensive, um, both in absolute terms and relative terms, especially when you consider, as the study just did, uh, the relative um, incomes of, of consumers. So a 
core organizing principle of the Royal Electrification Movement has been to find savings. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about the Rural Energy Savings Program Act, or RESP, and I have with me in the audience, I have Luis Bernal, Bob Coates, Steve Picciarillo, that's our energy efficiency team, and they really help us move this program along. Um, and this was really a brilliant idea to create RESP here on Capitol Hill and then to be able to fund it through the Appropriations Committee. Because what it does is it, it seizes the value of energy savings to make investments in the quality of life of rural America. So the structure of the REST program is very similar to another familiar economic development quote program that our sister agency, the Rural Business Service, operates called the Rural Economic Development Loan and Grant Program. So it's very much like the loan aspect of that. RUS will make a 0% interest loan to an eligible borrower. That would be a utility or a utility-like entity. Then we will find our security with that, um, with that borrower's assets. Then they will set up, the borrower will set up an energy efficiency program to make investments in the consumers of the utility. So it could be the could be residences, could be businesses, could be uh, educational institutions. The consumer then pays the utility back, um, our borrower pays them back through an on-bill financing mechanism. And that on-bill financing mechanism can be um, classic loan repayment or as Roanoke did, a tariff model which does not have to rely on the creditworthiness of the individual consumers that are benefiting or in case of a municipal utility, and it's called PACE financing, where your um, property um, rates, your property taxes are adjusted to reclaim that benefit. And then as the, uh, as the customers pay back to the utility, the utility pays us back. RUS will make a 20-year loan to the borrower, and then the borrower will then make, relend that money in 10-year increments, so you have a rolling set of energy efficiency improvements. And so think about what Curtis told you. They make an average $7,000 investment per home. I mean, think about how hard that would be, even in your own life, to come up with $7,000. Even if you can save money over the next 10 years, that's a big number to deal with mm -hmm. on an average consumer. So that's the power of capturing the economic value of those economic savings. So I'll go to the next slide. Um, RUS has $100 million available, at least $100 million, it's actually in excess of $100 million right now under ANOFA, Notice of Funds Availability, which runs through the end of the fiscal, this fiscal year. And when that runs out, we will, depending on how the appropriations um, play out over the next couple of weeks here, we will we'll likely reopen that for another round of funding in the next fiscal year. We're at, right now, very busy writing regulations. Um, Luis and I, every day, I said, Luis, how are we doing on those regulations? And we're, we, we're going through all the details because over the last three years, we have run this program that we called on a notice. And I saw Brandon McBride in the audience here. Brandon was our administrator of RUS on our first notice for this program. And we've done three of them under um, individual notices. Now the Office of General Counsel says, you know, you need to have a standing regulation, especially now that Congress has made it clear that this is a lasting priority. So we're working on that regulation, and that regulation will, um, again, um, give all the details. Zero percent interest. Our customers can charge up to five percent to their customers. All right, so we're going to make a zero percent loan to the utility. The utility can make a loan. They, they don't have to charge five percent, but they can charge up to five percent. And Congress raised that from 3% to 5% to make the program a little more attractive and allow uh, you able to recap the, the utilities to recapture some of their costs. And Congress has tweaked this. Uh, I mean, they really care about the statute because they've tweaked it along the way. One of the big changes happened in the last appropriation cycle where they, uh, Congress said, you know, the full replacement of a manufactured home with an energy efficient manufactured home could be an eligible energy efficient measure. Now we've tried to learn at RUS as much as we can about manufactured housing and Bob actually has a lot of background in that area and has been talking to people in the industry and we're, we're working with some potential applicants that we're looking at that model so it's pretty exciting. Think again, think about 
the transformation of an individual life to move from a 1960s era manufactured home to a modern energy efficient home and be able to finance that with the savings they would achieve on their energy bill. It's, it's, it's pretty profound and exciting. And um, another, another tweak that Congress made in the Farm Bill was to um, kind of expand our scope from electricity to more utilities. So it's a recurring bill, not just an electric bill, that those um, loans can be repaid. And then um, I will show you next here, this next slide. There we go. Oops. There we go. We've got about 14 loans where we have obligated funds. And you can see it runs the gamut across the country in size, represented here at the, um, at the table as well. And um, we have a, a number of more in-house that we're working with. And then once we get that regulation published, we have a few that will be benefiting from the farm bill changes that we'll be able to address. And um, you know, 14 on, on one hand, this is a, one of our youngest program. And it's a big decision, big decision for a utility to say, we're going to ch fundamentally change our, our view of the business from selling things to not selling things and then take out a loan. Because even though it's a 0% per percent interest loan, it has to be paid back. And we need adequate security to be able to secure that loan. So it's a big decision. So in such a short period of time to be able to commit um, over $50, billion, or $50 million of, of uh, financing to these first uh, early adopters is pretty exciting. And as these success stories roll out through the industry, we're getting more and more interest. We just had a webinar with NRECA members, um, 100 and plus uh, participants, and we're still getting feedback and questions. So we're, we're, we're promoting this program further and further, and it's very, very exciting. So I look forward to your questions, and I thank you for everything that you do. And uh, again, thank the members of Congress and the staff for being so supportive of this great program and our great agency. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'd like to now uh, bring a, another uh, uh, leader of a rural electric cooperative, a uh, rural electric cooperative that is in uh, uh, Representative Clyburn's district in South Carolina, uh, Chad Lauder, the CEO of the Tri-County Electric Cooperative. <coughs> Thank you, and thank you for having me here on this distinguished panel. Um, after following up Curtis, I really don't know if I need to say anything because uh, he, he kind of wrapped it up. Um, what I am going to speak about is the co-op in general and why we look at these programs. Um, I started my career 19 years ago as a guy that crawled underneath these homes to find out why the power bills are so high. Um, as you learn in the co-op world, you do whatever you're asked to do. And a lot of times it's all kind of stuff. So I remember distinctively the first couple of years I was there seeing these homes, the age of the homes, um, the conditions that these homes were in, and just how high these power bills were. And what you learn quick as you look at these, this, um, the power usage, your members that are at the lowest income levels usually had the highest power bills. It's just a fact of life. And the reason why is the manufactured homes they live in are typically older. Even though some of the newer manufactured homes are very good homes, they're well insulated, your typical member that is on the lower income scale will be living in a 1970s model mobile home. Or if they're in a stick-built home, it was a bit home built possibly by their parents or grandparents. It was built in the 70s, 80s. A lot, a lot of these homes have no insulation in them, have no insulation in the floor. And so when you go in these homes and, and, the, and they're typically upset with the utility asking, why is my bill so high? Are you charging me more than your neighbor or than their neighbor? And you have to tell them, no, we're not. You know, your rates are the same. Everybody's paying the same amount for power. The problem is they're using twice or three times the amount of energy that their neighbor is. And it's due to the home they're living in. Uh, one instance that sticks my brain even after so many years of doing this was a, a lady as a single mother um, in one of our service areas. She had called crying because she couldn't pay her power bill. Well, what does the co-op do? You know, we don't just say nothing. We don't, we, you know, 
we'll go out and try to find what the problem is. That's what we're here for. We're here to solve the problems of the members. So we went out there, looked at the home, couldn't really find what was going on. And finally I said, man, where's your heating for the house? Well, my heating unit broke 10 years ago, and uh, we just opened the stove up and heat the house with the stove. And if you've ever been in a house that where they're heating the house with a stove and smelled the smell that you smell in the house, you cannot believe what you're seeing in front of you. For one thing, she has five-year-old kids running around the house with a stove wide open heating the house. And it sticks in your brain when you see this, and you, you wonder what can be done. So after years of going through this process, in 2010, the electric cooperatives in South Carolina band, um, got together and started the Help My House project. And Help My House was a very simple project. Essentially, we do a home loan and tie the funds back to the bill or the repayment back through the power bill. Typical loan, like Curtis, was about $7,000, $10,000. But what you saw was they were saving 32% on their power bill. They were reducing that bill right off the bat. It was almost immediate savings they were getting. And from that savings, they were able to pay back that loan with the money they were saving on the power bill and still have excess money that they were saving. So it, it was a win-win for the member and the utility. These programs are structured for the co-op model. This is what we're here for. We're here to work with the members on a grassroots level to solve the problems of the membership. Electric Cooperatives of South Carolina took that, talked to Congressman Clyburn. Congressman Clyburn recognized the significance of this program and brought it to Washington. And now you see the USDA program that we just talked about is, is there. And Tri-County actually this month in August or next month in August, We'll be rolling out this, a new program to our membership, in which we, are, we have $2.5 million that we're going to roll out in energy-efficient loans to our members to save them money on that power bill. Now, it does cut down the usage, but it reduces our wholesale power bill. So it is a win-win for not just a member that gets that energy-efficient upgrade to the home, but it's a, it's a win for all of our membership because when it reduces what essentially is 75% of your cost is wholesale power. When it reduces that, that big bucket, that big ticket item, you see the savings across the board to every member. On the, on the environmental side, what you see is you may not have to build that next generating station. You've just reduced your peak. If you have enough of these in the, on your system, you've reduced that peak. And that generator, you may not have to build. So environmentally, you're reducing how much generation you have to put out, out there to supply power to the members. Um, I can't really think of any better program that, that the co-ops can offer other than possibly broadband. And I think that's coming down the road as co-ops look at this, as take the leadership into, into their areas to see where they can help with broadband. You know, co-ops were formed in 1940 to bring a service to an area that was not being provided for. People were in the dark in 1940. Co-ops ran this power to the, to the membership on the backs of the members, the members bound together to do this. Now, in the 21st century that we sit in today, there are houses without any internet, or if they have internet, it's slow, and you cannot do schoolwork on it. You can't do business. You can't do um, medical work on it. That's where the co-ops have to step in, and I think you'll see this, see that through the leadership of Curtis and those leaders in the co-op system is that that will continue to grow. At the core of it all stands is, stands is the co-op, and the co-op is its members. If the members request and they want these programs, those programs will be there, will be there for them. Um, a program like this through the USDA only helps the members all of them, not just the ones that are receiving that benefit. So we're proud to offer this program. We're proud to roll it out in August with our other co-ops in South Carolina as we um, move forward with these energy efficiency measures. And I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Mark, Chad. Chad, thanks so much for, for really, I think, tying a lot of these important ideas, laying out that business case one more time. 
building on the policy case that the congressman uh, talked about. We get to hear from uh, one more leader of a uh, cooperative, uh, Mark Case. Please join us uh, at the podium. Uh, he's the general manager of the Wachita uh, Electric Cooperative. Mark, it's good to see you again. Thank you. All right. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, gosh, it goes back several years. We lost our largest industrial customer. And uh, at the time, that's, that customer was about 12% of our total load. And I explained to our board at that time that equaled just over 100% of our total margins. And so our business model had to change. And the way we decided to change was to invest more in our members. And we've been facing a 20-year history of shrinking population. Companies closing, jobs going away, people disappearing from our community. And we wanted to do something to make a difference. And we started working uh, just on basic efficiency and weatherization. In fact, we were working with a company, Utility. I think some of them are here today, and they've been our partners since the beginning. And we started making these basic loans. And then I can thank Curtis Wynn. About two years into that, he brought us the concept of a tariff that could be used to help finance bigger investments. When we were making loans, many of our members were not eligible for loans. Anybody ever tried to go borrow money and get turned down? That'd be about most of our members. But when we went to a tariff-based program, credit was not an issue. Uh, there's no credit checks. If they were a member of the cooperative, they were eligible to get the benefits of our program. And our program uh, now includes uh, basic weatherization, duct sealing, insulation, air sealing, and new heating and air systems. And similar to Roanoke, we're averaging now about $7,500 per home. But the unique thing about the tariff is we were now able to go into properties that before were never eligible. Multifamily housing, rental property, people that could never uh, participate before in a, a population that's really hard to reach. And in fact, if you could go into multifamily homes and income was not an issue, and to be able to put high efficient heating and air in those homes was life changing. And so not only did they save money by lowering their power bill, but we're averaging about 15% on top of the payback on the loans, uh, additional savings for them to put in their pocket. And that's been an incredible change. This year, and because we had applied for a REST loan and got approved, um, we're looking at what else we can do to make our program even better. And we've added solar. And just in the last couple of months, we've completed our first three residential solar projects using the Help Pays model. And uh, that's been an exciting opportunity. Now, the people that are getting solar have to pay more down. They're not able to do it with zero down because we have to keep an 80% of the savings go back to repaying the loan. And to keep that ratio for most doing solar, they're having to come up with, with money up front. But that's a, been another benefit of the program. And I say we qualified for RESP funding. As you heard earlier, that's at 0% interest. And we wanted to pass that bonus back to our members. And so we are investing in our membership, and we're doing it at a half percent interest that we give to them. That half percent covers some of our administrative cost. But we wanted to pass as much of that savings back to the members as possible. And when you can do new HVAC and uh, you can recover it on the bill over 10 years at half percent interest, uh, it pays back in a hurry. The other thing we're doing, we wanted to raise the bar for efficiency. And so when we change out heating and air, we don't put the minimum that we can find. We, we are requiring a minimum of 16 sear 
air conditioning systems. Um, we do heat pumps and something unique to our program, if we go to a house and because we are regulated by our, our state utility commission, if they have an existing gas furnace, we replace that gas furnace with a new efficient gas furnace as well. And it's paid for on the electric bill. And since 2015, we've completed just over uh, 550 homes that we've been able to reach, which in the scheme of things is a fairly small number. But for, for us, we only have 7,000 members. And really, we only have about 5,000 residential properties. So the fact that in a short period of time, we have contacted or touched over 10% of our membership. And we continue to expand that program. We've added smart thermostats. And you know, you hear a lot about everybody trying to lower their bills and someone comes to us and, you know, if you want to know how to, where electric usage comes from, ask your electric company. We have these wonderful things called meters that give us tremendous amount of data. And we know more about where everybody's energy uses is than anybody, than even the people that are using it. But before, all we could ever do was give advice. And someone comes and talks to me because they can't pay their $300 electric bill. And I tell them if they'd buy a new heating and air system and add insulation and air seal their house, that they could save money and solve this problem. They, and they, of course, immediately tell me, I don't have the $300 to pay my bill this month. How am I going to come up with $7,000? And so now we're able to offer solutions and not just advice. Advice is always great to get, but solutions are a lot better. And solutions actually help people. So um, we continue to add the program. We've also started a fiber to the home project. Because of the work we were doing in energy efficiency, our local phone company came to us and said, would you like to partner on a broadband project? And to be honest, we weren't even considering broadband, but because they had seen the other work we were doing in energy efficiency, uh, they've now, we are now doing a broadband project and we have over 600 homes already served. So uh, anyway, we've had uh, great results and we're looking forward to, to doing more in the future. And thank you. Okay, thanks Mark. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Uh, now we do have some time uh, for some questions, and that can be to any of the panelists. I'm going to remind the panelists that uh, for recording purposes, this is the best mic. So please, uh, if, you, if you want to field a question, please come on up here. Um, any, any questions? And if there, yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Seth Heald. I'm with a campaign called Repower REC, working to reform a co-op in Virginia. And I'll address this to Mr. Wynn. Uh, we have tried to get our co-op, encourage them to in, uh, use a pays type program, a tariff based program, and found resistance. Uh, one of the board members told me this would raise rates. Uh, and there must be, I think this is common among a lot of co-ops. Uh, so I'd like to hear what your response is and, and what can we do to persuade more co-ops to do what we've heard from the three co-op CEOs here today? Great. Yeah, I appreciate the question, and, and I think it goes right back to what I was saying during my presentation. I think one of the chal uh, challenges that came to our co-op when we were one of the first ones to participate in the eClip program was to go out and talk to more co-ops about it. And I think where we may have fallen short in that is is providing the business case on the front end of that uh, and explaining what you've heard all three of us talk about in terms of the overall impact that it has for our systems. Um, on the bright side of that, I'm, I'm happy to say that we have been working with our, our private lending institution at CFC uh, to help us put a more comprehensive program together that will hopefully move the needle and to get more participation in the program coming from a trusted organization like CFC that could possibly put the whole piece together, all of the solutions together. 
the way we look at it, there are probably six major pieces to this. Um, one is getting that executive to understand the impact it's going to have on his or her financials. And I think once we are clear with that, it m removes a lot of the hurdles downstream, which is the program operation that we've talked about, the manpower that it takes to run the, or the, to run the program. I think pulling all of that together will help uh, more co-ops uh, get into this. I think the other piece to that is that, it, that we've been hearing a lot about energy efficiency, but you've heard little bits and pieces about demand response and smart thermostats. Uh, there are a lot of other components to this vehicle electrification that closely tie to this that I think will also help the vi business case even more using the same type of model that we've used with energy efficiency. So I hope that gives you a little bit of clarity on that. Thanks, Curtis. Other questions? Yes, sir. So obviously um, the co-ops and you guys have shown how these co-ops help people on a micro level and how the individual and individual families are greatly helped by co-ops. But what exactly is your overall policy and mission uh, towards the country on a more macro level and energy policy as a whole. I might, well, I'm, I'll invite maybe Curtis to um, to, to uh, answer that question for. You, you, you started. To say okay, I'll start a little. Well, I'll just I'll, I'll just start a little bit and talk about co-ops generally. I won't talk about rural electric co-ops because I I you know co-ops and I I didn't say that top. Most people in this audience probably know co-ops are a special type of business. They're a type of business that's owned. Uh, controlled and benefit the people who use the business. We're talking about uh, one of the co-ops that have really gone to scale and transformed, you know, particularly the rural countryside here on the rural, uh, with rural electric cooperatives. Um, but because of that dynamic, uh, the way that they serve their members and they focus on all aspects of the business as well as policy, I think is, is unique and, um, and just a really, you know, important thing to understand. But with that kind of setup, I'll just, I'll ask Curtis, who of course sure. is the, the chair of the Yes, so speaking from a policy perspective as it relates to NRECA, uh, the National Trade Association, one of our cooperative principles that we, we talk about a lot of the seven is the independence and autonomy principle. Chad's co-op is run by him and his local board. Mark's the same way. Uh, they have local decisions to make when it relates to the National Trade Association in a policy perspective, we have a very diverse membership of over 900 co-ops, ranging from distribution co-ops to generation transmission type cooperatives. So the policy really is, is all inclusive of, of making sure we provide a, a all of the above type of a, of a policy that, that when we come and talk about uh, the the ener energy burden is as well as the energy policy for electric cooperatives in general is really it, it, it covers a magnitude of areas that has to be inclusive of the multitude of multi millions and billions of dollars that are of investments that are already in place and the unintended consequences of what might happen if that is not handled properly as we transition to this whole new era of efficiency, demand response, distributed generation, and it's a moving. It's moving, but I, as I mentioned earlier, the pace is rapid, and and its policy has really taken a back seat to market demand. Uh, corporations, businesses, individuals, household owners, are pushing co-ops and pushing the whole utility industry at a pace that's much faster than policy ever could. I'll just add one more thought on um, scaling up. So I think one important component is really making sure we're elevating these successful program models and putting them on the radars of other co-ops uh, who are not currently offering energy efficiency programs but could be interested in doing so. That's where uh, USDA's REST program is so invaluable and, and it's important to make sure co-ops are aware of this important financing stream. But um, to your question about policy, I don't quite, I don't have the perfect solution, but I will just say that state energy offices and their association, state um, governors as well as the National Governors Association are all thinking about how their members can most effectively serve rural communities. And I don't always think that energy efficiency is at the forefront of their minds. And so that's something I'm trying to do is making sure we 
Um, collect examples of lo looking outside the, the co-op space, look at, look at state energy offices and governors who are effectively um, prioritizing energy efficiency as a tool for helping their rural constituents. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I think we have time for one more question, and maybe we'll go over here. Sorry. And I, I'm, I'm going to, as you're, as you're heading, well, two more questions, and we'll go here, and then we'll go over here. Uh, we'll make them fairly quick, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess and speak for the panelists that they'll be available uh, for the people in the room here. Uh, and they're also, you'll be able to, to find their contact information for those virtually, and they'd be happy to, to continue the conversation, but please. Great. Zach Valdez with uh, Hispanics and Energy. I have a question about what's the default rate on a lot of these loans y'all are handing out? Does that happen pretty often? And also, um, how do you... I think this is a really good opportunity for a regional perspective that is often overlooked. And I think that um, I'm, I'm originally from Texas, and I don't know that this is really the model for every state, but maybe for um, some of these more rural ones. No, I appreciate that question. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we've completed almost 550 homes, and uh, we've had one house that defaulted, and that's when it was a loan and not a tariff. Since we've used our tariff model, there have been zero defaults. And uh, that's the strength of the tariff, because even, even if someone moves out of the house, which uh, happens a lot of time when there are uncollectible accounts, uh, we've invested in the property and not in the individuals. Someone else moves in. Because it's a tariff, uh, it, it's part of that location. And utilities everywhere have tariffs for their rates the energy efficiency tariff is specific to each location and, because, and it depends on the amount of investment we've made. But we've included uh, some local school districts. We're working with our county now on new heating and air for the county courthouse. That's a hundred year old courthouse. And rural counties and schools are in the same situation as rural residents. They have limited access to funding, but if we can help those, those groups, it helps all of our members. And, uh, the default rate has been almost zero, one out of 550, and we're, we're doing pretty well. Thanks, Mark. Okay, uh, last question. Um, hi, uh, Emily Rampone, Senate Budget. Um, I'm assuming most of you saw the recent study um, that just came out of Chicago showing that wealthier communities are actually subsidized by poorer communities because they're more likely to be using electricity during peak hours, and I was just wondering if anyone has any potential solutions to that dilemma. <laughs> you gave this one to me. Okay. Um, you know, the idea of peak and off peak, um, if you had the ability to control your usage and you reduce your usage off peak and not use it, or reduce your usage during the on peak situation, it, it reduces the wholesale power costs. But right now, most utility rates are the same across the board. It's not on a demand type basis or on a peak, non-peak ratio. There are some rate structures that are going to that extent um, to where you're putting in um, an hourly type demand on each resident and then that person pays for that. Um, right now that's not the case. So whether the most co-ops across the country and most utilities across the country, you pay the same rate no matter when you use it, whether it's five o'clock in the afternoon or whether it's 12 o'clock um, or midnight, you use the same, pay the same amount. Rates are changing, and I'll be the first to tell you Tri-County is a small rural co-op. In South Carolina, we are um, about mid midstream, 18,000 meters. Um, we're looking at changing that. We're looking at changing how we build members. Um, rate structures are going to have to change. Most people need to understand you're paying or your rates that you're paying now were designed in 1940 when cost of electricity was probably two cents a kilowatt hour. Now it ranges anywhere from 25 cents to 10 cents and everywhere in between. Um, you're going to see these rate structures change to where members will be able to take advantage of when they use electricity. I firmly believe that the future of electricity or future of charging members will go to more of a time of use where if you do not use energy during this period, costs will be very low. If you choose to use it, costs will be high. So 
the more co-ops can educate their members of when to use it and when not to use it. And I think that's when you get into the demand response components of um, putting in smart thermostats, putting in uh, water heater switches to where you're telling members don't use it now, use it an hour later, and they will see that benefit directly on the bill. Right now, it's, it's the benefits and the wholesale costs, so members don't actually see it on a monthly basis. They see it on the long term, but in the future, they will actually see that on a monthly basis. So they say, let's just say uh, uh, somebody's at the house and they can choose to wash clothes at 8 a.m. on a February morning. In Tri-County system, you don't want to do that. That's the highest usage during February is between the hours of 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. If they shift that down to 11, 11 a.m., they will see that direct benefit on the bill. So your question of do they um, subsidize one or the other, you try not to, and I don't think you really see that directly right now. But I think in the future you're going to see these rates change or the rate structures change to where the members actually have physical control of when they use it, and then they can actually control how much they're paying for electricity during the time of day. Did that somewhat help out? Okay. Thanks, Chad. Chad, thank you, uh, and thanks to all the panelists. I just have just a couple concluding thoughts, a couple things that I heard um, that um, – you know, because of the, of the power of this uh, of this business model, of the cooperative business model, um, and and this intervention, this strategy, uh, the Congress has brought, that the agency has brought, and that most importantly, the cooperatives to serve their members have brought to the ground. I mean, we've heard the policy case for those uh, who care about putting more pockets or more pockets, more money in the pockets of rural families, and particularly economically distressed. Families, this is a strategy that can make a difference and it's proven. We've heard the business case a number of times from our IAC leaders that it certainly saves money for those families, but very importantly, it saves money for the cooperative as a whole, thus saves money for the entire membership. Uh, so we've heard that business case. And finally, we've heard uh, strong congressional support, both kind of from the authorizing side and from that appropriating side. This is a program that's here, that will be here, uh, and that can grow. And I think most importantly on that last point is that right now there are uh, significant resources available at RUS to move out on RESP, uh, to move out with this strategy. So for those in congressional offices, for those who are leaders within your REC, you know, please take a look at this program. Think about what it can do for your members. Uh, and now you've seen and heard some great examples. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the panelists, um, are going to be available right now, but I'm sure they uh, would be happy to answer questions, you know, virtually in the future with their contact information. Uh, and, and also, and I certainly can say that the sponsors, uh, and I want to thank EESI for sponsoring this. I want to thank the National Rural Electric uh, Cooperation, uh, Cooperative Association and then uh, NCBA CLUSA. Uh, we're here to answer questions and to help connect and to help improve the lives of, of your members as well. Um, and with that, uh, we'll conclude and just say thank you very much, everyone, for taking the time to be part of this conversation. Thank you.